Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, I'm Mike Toffel, a professor at Harvard Business School, and your, your moderator for this afternoon's session. Uh, a bit about me first, and then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. And then we'll get into a number of questions that, uh, that I have prepared, and then we'll be sure to leave time for all of you to ask questions on your own or make comments. So I'm sure a lot of talent in the room would want to take advantage of as well. So uh, I'm in our technology and operations management department at uh, Harvard Business School, where we study process design, process improvement, supply chain management. And my own work is on environmental issues and occupational health and safety. So uh, very well oriented toward this, uh, this panel. The panel was designed and really orchestrated by Heather. So when she's introducing herself, we need to say a word about that, uh, our fearless leader. So I got to know Heather Hendrickson, uh, our own university's chief sustainability officer, and Joe Allen through, through our presidential committee on sustainability, uh, for which I am one of the co-chairs, where we think about Harvard's own efforts, our own footprint, our own purchasing, and what can we do to reduce its environmental and health impacts, and then how can we cascade that knowledge around the world through our research, through our amplification efforts. And really, this panel is an example of what we're trying to do there. Uh, so it really kind of all ties together. So we're here to talk about the, the built environment uh, and the environment and health nexus. Uh, each of our panelists have a really distinct perspective on this. We have uh, two from uh, Harvard and two from uh, the greater world around us. And maybe on that note, let me ask Heather to begin. Brief introduction. I think I've to stop this <laughs> Okay. I'll just do a quick, quick introduction. So I'm, I'm Heather Henderson Heiner. Um, I'm Harvard University's Chief Sustainability Officer. And so what that entails is really working with the senior leadership and faculty, as well as staff, and really setting the vision for what does it mean um, for Harvard as a university, as an entity and organization, to you know, be sustainable. And we have a sustainability action plan that really defines what we mean by sustainable development, or their goals, priorities, and, and vision included in there. Um, so of course we have you know climate goals, fossil fuel free. You'll notice there's a sort of climate health and equity focus on whatever we do in a very holistic approach. I think that is what sets us apart. And of course that is because our competitive advantage are our researchers and our students, and that is sort of who we leverage when we are um, setting up goals and then even when we are implementing against them. And so we've had a huge focus at Harvard, um, not, you know, um, maybe not surprising, but on buildings. And that's because they're 98% of our emissions and they are, you know, 27 million square feet or about the size of, of like a multinational company <laughs> like Google. And so we have um, disproportionately focused on them, both from a decarbonization and climate perspective, but as this panel will talk about sort of the other side of the fossil fuel coin, also um, trying to get toxic petrochemicals and plastics out of our supply chain and our buildings. So I'll talk more about how we've been doing that um, and, and why we entered into to real focus on that maybe about 12 years ago. Stop there. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Joe Allen. I'm an associate professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I run our Healthy Buildings program. And I, my why is really simple, why, why healthy buildings? Um, really trying to drive home the fact that when we think about healthy living, uh, beyond the things we normally think about, good sleep, got to eat right, got to exercise, that the air we breathe indoors is having massive impact on our health. Uh, it's often ignored, it's often forgot about, but the reality is um, buildings, the way we design our buildings can either make us sick or keep us well. I spent the early part of my career doing forensic investigations of sick buildings. So a Bell's Palsy cluster in an office building built over a contaminated water plume. A uh, cancer cluster in an office building. Four people died in a hospital due to bacteria in the water. 11 infant deaths on a military base. Suspected cause was the housing. I get calls every week from people about issues related to their buildings. Um, and it's a problem because we actually know how to design and operate buildings correctly from the start. So we've been in the sick building area, we're chasing these issues, but there's a better way to do it. 
And I think that's a lot of our purview or solution mindset across Harvard. The other part is, Heather mentioned, buildings play a key role in our health beyond the four walls. Major consumer of energy on this campus, some cities it's 70% of global energy. Uh, they're also key to climate adaptation. They can protect us from extreme heat, wildfire smoke, teens out, we're doing work in Lahaina right now. We do post-wild, post-hurricane impact assessments in, and how it impacts people inside our buildings. So the climate crisis and the solution to it also run through our buildings. So that's ultimately our, why I care so much about buildings and why I know it's absolutely essential as a, one of our key public health tools of this century is getting our buildings right, because we've been quite honestly doing it wrong. I can talk as loud as Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe and Heather. Yeah. You got a good mic. I'm like, what the heck? But anyway, hi, everybody. I'm Annie Bevan. I've been in the built environment in sustainable buildings for about 17 years, and I've worn uh, many different hats, ranging from third party verification of uh, products and operations and executing third party eco labels and standards to being a sustainability director at building product manufacturers and knowing what it feels like to try and implement a sustainability program from the manufacturer side of things. and seeing that it doesn't really matter when it comes time to specify products to be more sustainable. Uh, and I have a, a great passion. Uh, my, my whole drive in life is to bring a community together uh, to scale in a macro level change, uh, to ultimately see a world where buildings are more sustainable. And I'm now the CEO of Mindful Materials, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that's here to see a world where sustainable products are the norm and not the option. We right now, in the industry, in the, in the built environment, can quantify the operational impact of buildings. We can say, here's how much water it uses, here's the carbon impact, here's the energy impact, because we're able to collect data on the operational usage of buildings. Buildings are made up of thousands of products. Thousands of products, look around this room. There's a thousand products in this room. And we are not at this moment in time able to quantify the impact that products make uh, to that, that, we, that make up buildings have. Uh, we have been able to make some inroads when it comes to carbon and body carbon and measuring the body carbon impact, but there is a whole world of impact that we have not even started to consider and how it interrelates with carbon when it comes to human health and toxicity, when it comes to social health and equity and slave labor, when it comes to biodiversity impact, when it comes to circular and end of life. And so Mindful Materials is a nonprofit that's seeking to bring an ecosystem of players across the industry, owners, architects, designers, contractors, eco-label standard providers, tech providers, manufacturers, uh, to solve the problem of being able to actually quantify the holistic impacts of products and projects so we can substantially reduce the impact on the built environment, not just operationally, into the future. <coughs> Hello everybody, my name is Ben Myers. I lead sustainability at BXP and we're a public equity REIT. We own, manage, and develop commercial real estate. Portfolio of about 55 million feet focused on premier workplace, life science, retail, and residential. Sustainability at BXP means developing, owning, and managing healthy and high performance buildings while mitigating externalities associated with energy emissions, water waste, and climate. And my role really materialized after uh, working at Harvard and then graduating into the wider world around us, as Mike put it, uh, 13 years ago, uh, Heather gave me my start in the Office for Sustainability, where I learned an awful lot about decarbonization and green buildings, and have taken a lot of the campus-wide institutional approach to sustainability and applied it in the private sector at BXP, which I think has helped us succeed in setting targets publicly, being very advanced on our environmental performance management, and over time have expanded the circle of consciousness, as you, if you will, to address healthy buildings and materials. Uh, I think Annie nailed it on in body carbon. We've made huge advances on environmental product declarations and the supply chain, engaging with life cycle assessment to tackle body carbon. I think there is work to do on materials. And I'm very glad to be on this panel focused on a critical issue around building materials and human health. Great, thanks. So let me, let me ask each of you um, a, a different question to sort of tap into the expertise that you bring. So Joe, you mentioned, uh, you, know, you dove right into the idea of focusing on health aspects of buildings. You mentioned there's 
key steps, we already know how to do that. So it strikes me step back, it strikes me as a kind of interesting that we've made more progress from buildings in understanding embodied carbon uh, from the construction elements and we understand energy use and focusing on all that. And it seems like only recently have we really focusing on uh, the health impacts, which seems backwards from agriculture. Now, agriculture products, people care a lot about the health. And when people say they prefer organic, a lot of them actually mean they want, they want fewer chemicals ingested rather than what's happening on the fields. But it seems different here. So I wonder, do you have any thoughts on why is it taking so long for health in buildings? You know, there's asbestos, you know, some examples in our history, but broadly speaking, people don't think about health in buildings except for perhaps over COVID, and you can talk about that. Yeah, I you know I think I think you're right that um, there's an expectation about the food we eat, yeah. uh, being able to know what's in it, but the, we haven't had the same kind of transparency as it relates to our buildings. I, I think really it's it's this. There's a couple things that are happening in the health material space. I think that's I'll, I'll set up the problem. I think that there's a whole set of chemicals that we use in our products that can cause a lot of harm that we can't see. So if you have VOCs, all the chemicals, your eyes irritate, okay, you notice that. You might smell something. It's best. It's well-known, well-characterized hazards. But what about the toxic chemicals that interfere in subtle ways with your hormone signaling system and interferes with reproductive success or immune system health? We can't see it. It builds up slowly over time. The reality is we're all part of this global chemical experiment. And maybe one specific example, when I talk about every chemical out there, is uh, forever chemicals. So raise your hand if you've seen forever chemicals in the news. All right. Good. Not good. It's bad. <laughs> but it's good that it's finally raised awareness. All right. So we've been talking about forever chemicals as a toxic chemical we're concerned about. That can cause things like testicular cancer, kidney cancer. In studies of women, uh, shows uh, interferes with lipid metabolism and can be associated with weight gain increases. Interferes with immune efficacy or the uh, vaccine efficacy in kids. So there's a whole host known about these chemicals. They're also forever. They persist in the environment forever. So they're ubiquitous. They're ubiquitous in all of our products in our, in our spaces. They're in all of us. 90% of us have it in our inner blood. Um, and there's a health concern. But it builds up slowly. It's not something that you see. And so the problem has been, I think there's an expectation that, hey, products we put in our building must be safe. Someone's looking out. For us, and the truth is, there's a problem. The regulatory system is broken. Just a couple weeks ago, the EPA regulated six forever chemicals. So it's a huge win. There are ten thousand chemical cousins. So this one by one, six by one approach is just not going to work. And most consumers think, well, should the government maybe be protecting us when it comes to, to uh, regulating these chemicals? That, that's not the case. It's not going to be safe from a regulatory standpoint. There's also not a safe coming from the industry that produces these. Big expose just a couple weeks ago showed that despite billions and billions of dollars of lawsuits around forever chemicals alone, at least one company is still manufacturing products, 16,000 products that still have forever chemicals in it. So the industry is not policing itself, which really sets up the problem. What do we do uh, for solutions? And that's where the work of Heather and her team uh, have really been instrumental in taking all this great science and uh, now what do we do? And we work together, turned into actually a strategy we're doing on our own campus. Okay, each of you can ask the next person a question like that. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Heather, what, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? Um, so when I heard about this about 12 years ago and really understood that, you know, there's this proliferation of toxic classes of chemicals, not just forever chemicals, but chemical flammatories, antimicrobials, phthalates, the smells, EPA. Um, and on every product, so you can walk into CVS and Target, Walmart, anywhere, and buy this, these things. You put them on your body, your dental floss. You know, you wear these out these jackets that are full of forever chemicals, and then you go home. You're like, oh my gosh, where are my mattress and my carpet and my flooring and my window treatments? And I just had this moment of I was a bit overwhelmed, um, honestly. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, Harvard does have a large capex budget. We buy a lot of things. We also have friends in the private sector that buy a lot of things. What if we could send a market signal to the manufacturers and say, not list of chemicals like has been done in the past, but based on the science classes, could we say we don't want any forever chemicals in our interior products? So that was really the vision 
12 years ago to try and solve the problem. The first thing we did, honestly, is we went and talked to them and said, I said, who else has already started doing this and how are they doing? And Google and Kaiser Permanente were a bit ahead of us. They were big owners. And then there were a bunch of nonprofits that were really, as Amy was talking about, trying to sort of document or create, create like nutrition labels for products. Tell us what's in the thing in a, in a very, you know, verified way. So we went and sort of got really smarter. We actually brought a group of, of folks to campus who've been working on this across the ecosystem. And what we found is, yep, there been a little bit of transparency advancement, but Google was actually, they thought, getting some, they were rewarding transparency, so they were getting transparent products, but they feared by their research they were getting the most toxic products. So, and they were also trying to do an entire building, and they just were failing. So we said, what if we try classes of chemicals and just picked a few that are some of the worst of the worst, fiber chemicals, chemical flinters, antimicrobials, often put onto products at the end and not functional, and got those out of, the, out of, out of a few products, carpet, floor, and furniture. This was back in 2014. And then we just started to do it. And you know, our first project was, was Smith Campus Center, where there were 3,000 pieces of furniture, 27 furniture manufacturers, 75% of whom did not know what I was talking about when we called them. <laughs> and you know what? We did start early, but every one of those manufacturers did it. There were only two that didn't. Um, the rest made it into the project, did it on time and on budget. And that's when we knew, okay, at least we could start to make progress. Fast forward to today, we've done 50 projects representing 55 million square feet. Um, we have continued um, to partner with other owners and share knowledge, of course. But now, in all of the interiors that Andy was talking about in here, pretty much, we've at least gotten rid of those classes of chemicals. There's no forever chemicals. There's no um, flame retardants. There's no antimicrobials. And in some cases, there's other things like no fly ash or no PVC. So we have been able to do it. We've been able to do it at scale. We sort of created a playbook. We've had Brown at least try it, and they've been able to recently to validate it and say they can do it. And it's similar to now where sort of Kaiser Permanente and Google also are at. That's where we come into, can we get Ben and his big company to do this that's you know, a real leader in the development arena? And can we work with Annie and nonprofits to really now work on the standards and get this out there and, and work on databases and making it easy and turnkey for people to do that. So that's sort of like beginning to end um, where we are. But I think because Harvard is a research and teaching institution, we really thought, to Mike's point, our job is to educate people, make them aware of this science and research, and to then see if we can translate that into practice to try to make progress in solving this problem at scale. Um, so that's that. So let me just ask you, Heather, to just elaborate. So you discussed what we're doing on campus, but you're also doing a lot beyond working with individual companies to sort of broadcast what we're doing. So you talk a little bit about the academy and your work with pop schools, just to yeah. give people a flavor. Yeah, so I think um, I've been wanting for a decade to work on a public school project. And we finally got a public school, thanks to Mike, um, to take us up on this. And I think it was because they had a very dedicated city PFAS-free committee. And they wanted a PFAS-free school, as we all should have. And so I think you know the architects and, and contractors threw up their hands and said, fine, you can be on the project, you know, help us do this. So Harvard actually is um, on the actual project team. Rebecca's helping our team as well. And we are literally hand in glove with the architects, with the specifiers and designers, um, and the contractors, literally trying to make sure we can have meet all of their very strict procurement rules. Also, some of their products are not, you know, as commercial, they're more residential than our products. So we're making sure that essentially, at least in the interiors, we do think that we can give them a PFAS free school. The exterior is gonna be much harder and that's the work that we are now doing, again, we are part of multiple sort of owners, buyers, clubs, 
And um, you know, that's where we work with, with Joe Allen and Elsa Sunderland and other faculty where we're now trying to just do what we did at Smith Campus Center. We are talking to these manufacturers to make exterior products. They're all full of PFAS, by the way. Paint, sealants, adhesives, everything in insulation. Um, we are now talking to them and trying, there's opacity in that marketplace. So you need transparency that's like third party verified so you know it's true. And then you really need to work to optimize for health. And what I think we're doing is to just send that very clear market signal to manufacturers, which has been frustrating for them, that you may not be able to do it all today, like those exterior products, but we want none of these classes of chemicals in our products. We really want you to get them out, and we want you to either not use them or find such safe, healthy alternatives that are not toxic petrochemicals in their, in their basis. So we're scaling this out with public schools, with affordable housing, um, and advising on that. And then we also have a playbook ready to sort of share with the world. Um, and that's also where, again, we're working with Mindful Materials, which is an aggregation of private sector companies, higher institutions, other owners, um, architects, designers, um, contractors, engineers, and manufacturers. So that's where this sort of all comes together where, because if Harvard just does this or Google just does this, it doesn't move the market. And so now that we've proven it can be done at scale, we really need to get it into the standards and get this knowledge into the hands of everyone who is buying products so that it could scale. Great, Great. thanks. That's such an interesting story. So Ben, let's, um, let's bring you in at this point um, and then go to Andy. So Ben, you're operating you know, in a commercial context with different pressures than Harvard has, um, where you are, but similarly to us in some ways, you're designing, building, and, and maintaining the ownership of, of buildings over the long term. So how are you putting into practice your, grow, your, your personal and the market's growing realization about the healthy building movement? Sure. So first, we're listening to Heather and Joe. And we've worked with Joe uh, on our indoor air quality approach in the Nine Foundations work. We've tried to assimilate as much as we can that information across our portfolio. Um, you saw how quickly the industry was able to coalesce around indoor air quality from the COVID, right? The pandemic response unleashed a flurry of activity that I think has been very sticky, even through today, around filtration and airflow. And I'd say nobody in my career has done more to elevate the importance of ventilation than, than this guy right here, Dr. Joe Allen. Um, you see it routinely, his specs that he wrote into his books and wrote into his research are showing up on the street for requirements that we're seeing from major clients, cities like New York and Boston, San Francisco, LA, Seattle. It's, it's become quite the mainstream. So the question I have is without catalysts from investors, right, who want us to move on decarbonization, I've been very direct with our management team, we want you to decarbonize, we want you to be net zero. We're not getting that same signal on healthy buildings and materials. Without demand from clients, which are another major lever, who are saying, we, we want the ventilation, we want the electrification of the asset, but they don't have very clear, they won't embody carbon reduction, but they're not on very clear signals on building materials and human health, um, except for a LEED certification, which is a, 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 a softer approach to chemical, chemical concern avoidance than Heather suggested, right? Um, in her remarks, right? She wants classifications banned for buildings, right? Is my putting words in your mouth, Heather? She'd like to see them. I want classes of chemicals, not lists of chemicals. Because what, what happens, and Joe can describe this even better, Joe's named it chemical whack-a-mole. Yeah. Yeah. One bad PFAS comes out, another goes in, it's just not a study, could be worse. The BPA replacements are worse. So that is just perpetuating the problem, not solving it, and then worse, people think it's solved. Yeah. So we're, we're seeing a sentiment shift on this issue it's, it's becoming a, a topic that's increasingly written about. There's public awareness growing, and we expect our client base will be more focused on PFAS and other chemicals of concern. So what we're doing is we're implementing uh, red list chemical avoidance. We are requiring our consultants and our contractors and our construction managers and development project managers to collect health product de declaration forms, HPDs, to evaluate 
materials that we're procuring for our projects. We think that's having, it's sending a signal uh, to material vendors, manufacturers, OEMs that this matters to DXP. It, we, we only want to shift, we want to shift our buying to uh, materials that don't contain these chemicals. And when you look at the real estate industry, they, we purchase about $2.1 trillion a year of building materials across the U.S. That's every year, $2.1 trillion. So this, is, this issue of PFAS is, is billions of dollars worth of materials that are flowing into the real estate space. Another thing we do is we share uh, our findings where they're difficult to substitute materials. Sealants, you know, that's a definitely a challenging area. Paid sealants, coatings, insulation, as Heather mentioned, that's where we see it's harder to find substitutions. I think being able to navigate those substitutions is, is going to make us more successful in the real estate industry because you don't have a project manager that says, well, we can't find something else at the same cost to do this, to perform this way. So we're going to go with the regrettable substitution. <laughs> That's Joe point there. Uh, but the, we, we want to make sure we're not giving them an out by not having a suitable alternative that meets our material health goals. So back base station office tower future development is going to be our first building. We're trying to eliminate a lot of these chemicals. Uh, we're also working on some life science development here in Cambridge where we have red list of avoidance written into the specs. What makes it into the specs during conceptual design is key. Like owners need to be very explicit in their project requirements. This is what we want. And they need to say it like not day two, but day one of, of meeting with their, <coughs> their architect and consultants on the project to make sure it's written in stone uh, early on in design. Great, so Annie, let's turn to you. So you mentioned earlier your, uh, your Mindful Materials nonprofit is trying to coordinate this ecosystem of uh, building owners, designers, architects, builders. What, is, what are you trying to converge on and what are the main challenges you're facing? And maybe some successes if you can share those. Two. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And um, noting that Harvard and Google and Kaiser Permanente have been at this game for a long time, a couple others as well. And uh, we're at a point of proving that this can be done uh, by leaders in the industry. Uh, we're at Harvard. This is Harvard. Harvard has now done this. How do we enable anyone in the industry to do this? And the problem with sustainability, it's been really hard to grasp because we've been talking about it in classes of chemistry and not in terms of impact. And uh, we also need to define what are we trying to achieve. I call it the materials easy button. So how can we actually have any architecture architect look at a material, compare it across multiple impacts, and say that product is better than this product based on a set of material standards? How can we have a manufacturers be able to easily communicate to those architects, here's our holistic impact, here's how it translates to your material standards, and here's how my product actually supports you in achieving your more sustainable building overall? Uh, this is the ultimate goal that we're trying to enable to the industry. And as we, as we noted, and Heather could lament about, I would imagine, um, this has failed many times in the industry uh, to try and take it from a just individualized approach to everyone being able to accomplish this. There have been numerous examples of people, large companies, trying and, and failing at this. Um, the re some of the reasons why this has failed before is because we've actually not had it consolidated common language that we've been using to describe sustainable building products in the history of buildings. If I ask everyone in the room, how would you define a sustainable building product? Every single person here would say something different. This is what I consider a sustainable building product to be. It's actually kind of mind-blowing uh, to think about. And so Mindful Materials has created the industry's first common language for sustainable building products called the Common Materials Framework. We took 600 plus equal labels and standards across the industry that all tell you different things about a product sustainability uh, and we basically map those to impact. So how can a product actually show that they're addressing human health, climate health, ecosystem health, social health and equity, or circularity? And uh, the Common Materials Framework is now a means in which case we can connect third-party verified building products to impact. We can start to communicate now at the impact scale. I have a Cradle to Cradle certified product. I have an HPD. Here's how this connects to impact. What this also does is it actually drills down to what is being third-party certified in this certification? What data does this third-party verified, verified system actually give us? And it connects data to impact. 
Now we need an ability to actively have everybody in the industry start to use this common language to communicate it up and down the value chain. This is where the clear market signal comes into play. If Harvard and Google and Brookfield Properties and Boston Properties and uh, Bensler and HOK and uh, HKS all start to ask manufacturers for the same thing in the same way, manufacturers then hear, I need this. In order to do business, I have to give an answer back. Manufacturers, though, then have an opportunity, coming from the manufacturing side of things, we are asked so many different things in so many different ways from everyone because everybody's defining sustainable products differently. This gives manufacturers an opportunity to communicate in the same way back. If we then also build out data systems and have technology actually work for manufacturers, we can actually use and leverage digitized data that is third-party verified through these equal labels and standards, connected to impact, and see that data flow. So we can actually start to then see how a product meets a material standard and what product, how does this product actually show impact across climate health, human health, ecosystem health, social health, and equity, and circular economy. And we can actually start to think about holistic impact of products and projects to get to that materials easy button. It's gonna take technology, it's gonna take certification, it's gonna take clear market signal, common language. It's also gonna take uh, data actually connecting to, for us to get there. But that's the materials easy button that we're shooting for and this is how Mindful Materials is starting to address, address these, uh, these issues. Great. So, Joe, I see you diligently taking notes. Do you want to share your, uh, your perspectives on well, what you're hearing? Uh, I think coming at it like Heather and you and, and thinking about, so right away, I think these are the people we have to listen to if, if we're going to think about it. So I'm taking notes. Okay, what does Ben need? He needs the value proposition to execs. I love the easy button. If the architects need it easy, and then it's like, all right, how do we design the studies and produce the information that just then feeds them what they need, right? So anyway, I, I was listen. I think it's great that we connect with people outside of our ecosystem, out of the Harvard space for sure, including businesses, because these are where all the good they tell you their needs just while they're talking. So I have nothing related to this stage. It's my own back in my head. Oh, this is what I'm I got to get Ben the value proposition. You can to executive to make that happen. So anyway, that's, that, that's, that was my note take. Yeah. I mean, I actually want to jump in there. Yeah, go ahead. So if we actually can measure the holistic human health impact of a project, because we know the holistic human health impact of products in that space, wouldn't we argue that the value of the real estate is greater because we can actually prove that building has a less harmful impact to humans in that space? I just, I, I don't think the appraisal people are, are that sophisticated. <laughs> so you need a, a, a label or a certification that matters. Yeah. Right, and that clearly addresses these individual issues on, on almost like a, a prerequisite level, right? So you can't skirt around these critical issues, still get the label, uh, you have to directly attack them. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then the appraiser people will, will say, oh, this label is a proxy for good, this, value, this building is worth more. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which, of course, that has to reflect market reality, right? it's not just the appraiser's wish list. Right. right. There's a difference between I wish this were worth more in the marketplace and people actually value it. Are you seeing, Ben, your ability to, uh, since you're in the business of renting for your space, as I understand it, so are you seeing any premium for healthier space? I think we'd say that our business is healthier space. We're in the premier workplace mm -hmm. business. And in an era of work from anywhere, being the premier workplace business has made our office performance more resilient to the, the market volatility with a lot of people moving out of B and C office space into A because there's better daylight, better air quality, better views, um, presumably better materials health, although we have other selling a few buses everywhere, so we can't be sure until we have people like Annie creating more clarity and transparency around what's in the buildings, right? So, so I would say we've seen historically energy efficiency become important, decarbonization become more important. There's no doubt in my mind that there are clients out there deciding whether or not they're going to be in a building as one of the factors. Does it have a, a gas-fired boiler, God forbid, fuel oil? So they're moving away from fossil fuel combustion buildings to electrified buildings with some renewable component. That, they definitely want that. And do I think that this, that this focus on building materials will eventually yield the same sort of uh, potential value 
I, I do. I do. I absolutely do. As, as clients become more sophisticated and well-versed in, in this issue. Can I add something on this? Because it goes back to a meeting Heather and I wrote years ago convincing our own architects um, that this mattered. Because it came up, you know, what's the return on this? And I remember what I said, you know, some of these chemicals interfere with hormones. Even the new safe flame retardants are associated with a decreased risk of giving live birth. They interfere with sex, increased risk. They, they interfere with our sex hormones. So what, when we're talking about cost benefit, how are we going to look across the room at our students and say, yeah, yeah, we value engineered health out of this building because we saved a couple bucks, we couldn't figure out the ROI, and the downstream cost is, well, it's your reproductive health. Like, let's put health onto this balance sheet of having this conversation. And immediately it kind of stopped the room, it was intentional, to say, like, this is really what we're talking about in terms of the value here and how to communicate that. And we have that advantage of Harvard to be able to kind of play that card, honestly. But that's how I think about it when we're talking about these chemicals, and it's just, it's so um, hidden from the calculus because we can't see it and we can't see the impacts, and it could, it's years of accumulating inside our lives. Heather, did you have some questions? I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna say, so I think we have been, and I just said this earlier, but three things. So one, we were trying to get the hardest challenges to be addressed like public schools, where it's just the, the pricing and what they can pay is very different than a commercial entity, um, certainly, you know, Harvard. And I think, you know, if you can get that to work, that could scale, right? Then you're at the point where those products are available and people could afford them and, and, and find them. Secondly, I think we really have been trying to influence these standards. So Ben is talking about they follow this red list standard. And I think that's the that's one of the challenges is if you're a large commercial company, you often have to have like a third party open source standard to follow, right? Because we understand that we also have myriad projects. Um, but I think that is why Harvard has also and, and the Harvard Healthcare Building Academy has been trying to really work with US Green Building Council, work with people that make the HP, the the, in, the ingredient disclosures work with a red list and the International Living Futures Institute that oversees that to evolve the standards to be grounded in the science. Just like climate has evolved to the science is now driving you know, the solutions and the, the, um, where we need to head. So I think that we really have been, you know, Joe and I and others have been digging into the, the influencing the standards because then Ben could use it at scale. So we've been very focused on that behind the scenes. And I think ours is a proof of case shown by at least, you know, dozen of folks so folks can do it, but I think can influence those standard bearers to change their standards. And then last, I think that, you know, this is why we really encourage Andy to stop, to, to come take over Mindful Materials. So Google and, and, and Harvard and uh, Berkfield Properties and a couple others stepped up as anchor owners and said, we will fund you to try to get this together. And then we got others to, to join us, not only on the owner side, but manufacturers, architects, um, and, and contractors. So that's the other way that we're really trying to influence this is, is you know, I'm not gonna be able to scale this out in the world, I have a day job, but Annie, working with all of us in this ecosystem could take the best of our knowledge and actually along everyone and get it out there is, is our thinking. Well, this, this being um, Harvard uh, Climate Action Week, I want to make sure we get the climate story. So Joe, you and I talked a little bit. Can you sort of just reveal the connection here between the climate story and the health story? Yeah, sure. I mean, what we're talking about here are petrochemicals, right? So this is a, uh, um, a stream uh, for um, uh, for fossil fuels, it's a, it's a, a business stream. It's a toxic, another toxic byproduct of our fossil fuel industry that doesn't get always connected to that conversation. And when we focus on healthy materials, we talk a lot about what's happening in these spaces, but it turns out that we know that there's a lot of these upstream impacts that actually don't get calculated at all. We've tried to do this very difficult. Think about the energy that gets used in, well, the source product, fossil fuels. These are petrochemicals. The energy that's used to create these products, these toxic chemicals. What happens to the workers in the workforce who are exposed to this? 
we've seen this over and over again, um, higher levels of, of, uh, of exposure to these chemicals and people who are in these industries. Um, we see localized contamination around these industrial sites. So we focus on what's happening in the use, but we know that there's upstream costs, it's all fossil fuel based, and then there are of course downstream impacts. So we part, you know, ultimately climate's about sustainability, global impacts. How can we continue to use forever chemicals on our campus knowing they last forever? They don't break down. So we're using these products that will be out in the world, they will last forever in the world and get into all of us and then has potential to cause these health impacts. So there's a clear connection, I think, between chemicals of the and health materials movement and the climate goals and worker health and safety, health and equity and justice, downstream environmental impacts, and our goals really have a sustainable environment. These, these toxic chemicals that we're talking about here, um, the ones we're focusing on, they, they're, they're permanent in the environment means it's a sustainability issue, right? This is ultimately, um, it's all related, I see it's one long chain. Yeah, you know, microplastics too, I guess. That is. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so um, by now you've gotten 40 minutes of a dose of these fantastic people. You know a little bit about who you're speaking with and what they can speak to. Let me open it up to see if there are questions in the audience. I have some more questions in my back pocket in case you're shy. I won't call call, but uh, let's just open it up. Yeah, So. I'm Tom Holton, graduate of the School of Public Health, and one of the things they teach you in the Occupational Hygiene Program is risk is a function of, of hazard and uh, exposure. Really what I'm hearing about is a, is a program geared around the hazard and eliminating, you know, if you eliminate the hazard, you eliminate the problem. But are there certain products because of their use, because of their volatility, because of their quantity, that should be prioritized as being the ones because of the potential for exposure and others? That are more minimal and less of a concern. And, and the flip side of that is, are there better products that we're uh, that provide better cost value and use? That there's no brainer. People should be switching those and looking to take, uh, seize upon those opportunities right away. So, you want to feel that? It's a great question from a school of public health grad. Of course. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot. Happy there, I think you're right. So in terms of thinking about the exposure piece, if you think about something like asbestos, um, there's no exposure if it's secured. But once you start cutting into the stuff, then it becomes a problem. But think about forever chemicals, I find really interesting. I'm think, working on a piece on this. So if somebody could write about this, I would love it. I actually don't think they last very long in the products. In other words, they're not very stable. If you look at some of the classic products that have forever chemicals, like Scotchgard, look on the bottle. It says reapply every three months. Where's it going? How long does your non-stick forever chemical pan last? Scramble eggs start sticking after like two months. Where is it going? It's coming off the products. They don't really last very long in the products, so we know they're coming out. And in fact, a lot of these organic chemicals like the flame retardants that are in chairs and carpets, they're called semi-volatile compounds. They migrate through the products and they off-gas and can be in air and dust forever, for decades. Take PCBs, so polychlorinated biphenyls, very similar. It's a halogen, the chlorine, we're talking about forever chemicals, fluorine, a halogenated compound, bromine flame retardants, bromine. PCBs are banned in the 70s. Still an issue in schools today. PCBs and caulking because they off-gas slowly. So I think it's, imp it's an important comment that yes, it's not just that it's there, but we actually know there's exposure happening. We see it in our blood, so biomonitoring shows it's everywhere through all of these pathways. It's impossible to parse out, I think, exactly. So I like Heather's, this is a very smart approach. to say, we don't want any of them. We don't need to know which one's the worst one. We don't want any of them. And we don't want them anywhere in these products. So we know we purchase a lot of them and use a lot of them. Um, and so the last thing I'll say, because I guess the school public health comment, we know this works. So in terms of the exposure question. So I had a doctoral student work with Heather and her team. And we collected air and dust in the spaces that were mandated to this new standard or not. And sure enough, in the buildings where we have this new standard, we see lower levels of forever chemicals, flame retardants, and microbials. So ex point is exposure, we see it in our, our buildings and every building you've ever been in. And then when we intervene, the exposure reduces. You know, exposure, um, you know, you reduce the exposure, you reduce, reduce the risk. Yeah. Um, so there are some product categories that are ahead of other product categories. Uh, carpeting, flooring have been asked to evolve, they've been business reasons why they have uh, leadership in other areas. Uh, mindful materials and our next step with this ecosystem group and community is uh, working to actually evaluate how aligned um, everybody's current material standards are. So taking Harvard standard, Google standard, 
Gensler standard and uh, looking to see what product categories are you asking for information from, in what language, and how aligned or unaligned are these, are these standards. Um, and we ultimately are going to actually be able to say, here are the product categories that you can actually do this with now, everyone. Here is the resource uh, to do this with now, to start to scale. And then where are some of the product categories that we, we have a lot of work to do, because they this just nobody's been asking, they haven't heard that it matters enough. And then we're going to target <laughs> with a very much more clear ask to start to drive, similarly to carpet flooring furniture, that more targeted response and start to set priorities based on product categories, and then share that with the community to enable that, that easy button as well. Let's get a few more questions here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, one, one interesting area where we saw these show up this last year was specifying low GWP global warming potential refrigerants. And there's a there's a certain set of refrigerants that actually have contain PFOS that have low global warming potential but have the negative side effect of PFOS, just like lower carbon and concrete often has fly ash and toxins associated. So there, there are some interesting trade-offs there. Uh, for the refrigerant in particular, I think it's time we move towards a more European standard of CO2 as refrigerant under higher pressure. I think it's, we're overdue for that shift in the U.S. Um, and I just have a question for Joe. How hard is it to test your blood for PFAS? And uh, should we be checking uh, it's, PFAS blood? It's hard and expensive. I think you need a professional laboratory. It's, gonna, it's not like commercial. I actually I do know that there, there's one of these uh, commercial companies Said, but one offers now that for, for people. I don't think it's something you would, I don't know what you do with the information if you have it. It's in all of us. It's constantly, we're constantly exposed to it. And this question of like, well, is it one of the six we regulate or one of the 10,000? You told me I have a couple of these BFAS in me. Um, you know, these current commercial tests are missing the whole suite of thousands of other ones that were barely scratching the surface on of understanding. So I, I wouldn't recommend it as like a I'm not sure what you do individually uh, to do anything if you have information about what's in your own body. It's in all of us, for sure. Question in the back. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. I'm Ishik from, uh, I live between Turkey, Istanbul, and London. I've been investing in climate businesses for a long time, um, including decarbonization, you know, uh, hydrogen, etc. And um, I recently learned that the world's GDP, about 10, to 15% of the world GDP is run by Harvard graduates. I don't know if you knew this statistics. <laughs> Whether it includes board seats, nonprofit, etc. Now, this week, and I'm going to be critical now and politically incorrect. So, this week, and I was at the climate conference last year as well. I sit on multiple boards at Harvard, I end up scholarships, so I'm very involved with Harvard. But at the same time, I see both last year and this year a lot of climate less action. So when you talk about action, I see a lot of the Americanized version of, you know, the Googles. One of the companies that I have invested in actually is being, you know, invested by Google X, and it's about methane reduction in housing as well as oil, oil and gas. So Google X is taking this to now proof of concept. Though. But the Googles are, and the company is Italian. So how did we find this company? Google found it. But what I see here is that GDP of 10 plus percent of the world, how is it being used? I was talking to another colleague of yours recently, and the entrepreneurs that have to come together to build a better world, like myself, I'm not doing this to make money, I'm doing this because I have a civic duty to the world, I've made my money, now I have to give it back. So the way that this works is not the young entrepreneurs where you know he's trying to, I don't know, make steel more, like, look at steel and cement. You didn't even talk about steel and cement, which emits 15% of the world's, you know, emissions. Steel alone is 10%, 4 to 8% are cement. So what are you guys doing when buildings are, you know, already with initial sort of construction, it's already carbon emitting. So what I want to say is I want to see, as a Harvard graduate, HBS grad, and a person who's very involved in the school, who wants to give back to the world so that my kids can have a better world. How do you make everybody get together on these ideas that we can, we can have a more common sense except individual silos? Because you guys all talked about silos, what you guys are doing alone. But I don't see you collaborating with me or the likes of me 
where we can, you know, invest, we can create research, we can, you know, make Harvard sort of the best of its of, of the team of, you know, Ivy Leagues because everybody is doing something. But how do we make this disseminate to the public? I don't see that. Whether Chief Sus said, I mean, I know Jim very well. I, I have never met you, but I mean, all these things seem very up in the air for me. Uh, as an entrepreneur who built multiple businesses, I want to see executionable ideas where people come and collaborate together. Sorry, it was a long one. So there's a lot there. Um, yes. But I don't think 10 minutes would do. And then we I want to get to at least one, one more question. But I think if you think about what is, what is Harvard as an institution, what does it do? The way I think about it is it, it conducts research, it has teaching programs, and, and we have convenings, and we have this institution, we have a physical footprint. And of course, there's lots of stakeholders that we engage with, including our alumni. And so the question of what are we doing, like, there's a long list, both that HBS produces in its own Business and Environment Initiative annual report, that Harvard University uh, Center for the Environment, and the uh, the, the organization, the Office of Sustainability, that Heather creates the Salada Institute. There's a growing momentum of the number of things that institution is doing, including this week, right? And you said we were here last week, last year as well. So I'm happy to talk to you offline, but just for example, the ideas of green concrete and green steel, uh, there's many things we're doing. So for the first time ever, every Harvard Business School first year just learned about green concrete and green steel in required courses. Um, learning about both uh, the, the strategies of those organizations, the accounting of those organizations. Uh, and that's just one example. There's a podcast, there's many podcasts now at Harvard that deal with environment and climate, including one that I'm host of, Climate Rising, <laughs> available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and, and we just had a whole uh, series on difficult to abate sectors, including concrete and steel. So if you look, there's actually more and more going on, more than, I can say confidently, more than you have here, and it's not you, it's anyone that had here, because the momentum is really increasing. There's lots of work that we're doing on, on building materials as well. We have, I mean, there's only so much we can talk about in an hour. But Heather, you want to talk a little bit about, about I'll just do really quickly. So Harvard has fossil fuel free by 2015, fossil fuel neutral by 2026 goals. So we are actively working um, project by project to decarbonize the campus and get all of the fossil fuels out of every building, of our district energy system, of all of our vehicles. And um, again, our purchase electricity by 2026 will be all renewable. Um, and we have, new, we have building standards that we've had since 2009 and continue to upgrade. They do require um, we renovate or, or build a new, basically an all-electric building. Um, and we do require, you know, at least a 20% minimum cut in body carbon in all of our projects. We, uh, we do have material health requirements, not just the interiors, um, but we also have them for concrete. And we want people to give us low body carbon concrete that is full, is free from fossil fuels. So we don't want them to give us fly ash, which is a toxic byproduct of burning coal. So there's a number of, and they're going to be on our website any day now, our new sustainable building standards. So I think you know, they, they align with the Living Building Challenge core requirement, not LEED, which is a much more robust, holistic, complex um, certification. So I think there's a lot there, to, to Mike's point. And, We'd be happy to talk to you more, but we're doing trying to do a lot on the buildings. I think today we were just really focusing mostly on the what we're doing related to health first, but these, but it also is climate and equity as well. So the uh, last question, and then we're going to do closing remarks. So, yep, yeah, you're good. All right. Um, my name is Michael, and I'm a Harvard Sustainability Master's candidate that also does store design for a national retailer, for an international retailer. Um, when you're talking about mindful materials, and you're talking about being able to test the air quality for the PFAS, has anyone ever done any studies on the sick day impact of that change and quantified it is one of my questions because that then becomes something that can be used to counterbalance 
net present value of the cost increase of the healthier material. <clears throat> so if there's a way to sell that as a concept, has that research been done? And then the second question is, you're talking about building materials and building a database of the healthiness of the materials. At lunch today, we had plastic wrapped cookies in the boxes. Are we also quantifying the forever chemicals that are used for the materials that go into toilet paper, paper towels, single use cups, the cleaners that the cafe uses at the Smith Center? Are those also in scope or is that a separate project from a separate entity, <coughs> separate database, separate codification? So let's try to make that responsive somewhat inversely linked to the question. <laughs> like, can you speak? Of course. So I'll answer the first part. So I have a book written with uh, Mike's colleague at Harvard Business School on uh, basically the business value case for healthy building strategies where we talk about and bring in the science, including the business science, mm -hmm. of things like how better buildings lead to reductions in absenteeism, better cognitive function, better performance. So there's a clear business case. We about, wrote about this in HBR several times. So I'll give you a copy of the book. What's called what? What's called Healthy Buildings, How Wonder Spaces, <laughs> Make Us Sick or Keep Us Well. I said it again. <laughs> yeah, and then in terms of mining materials, right now we are a growing nonprofit. We are a volunteer led and run organization for 10 years. We've been around for 10 years. We recently just became a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Our business plan is scalable. We're focused on commercial buildings and the, build, the products that go into commercial buildings, but the, build, the products itself, not for the cleaning supplies or the operational maintenance products at this time. There is no reason with the proper funding and staffing for us to scale this model operationally, as well as to residential as well. Uh, and I think we all know that 50% of the built environment's impacts are due to residential impacts. We need to bring this to average consumers. Our goal is not to stop it commercial globally, but to bring this to residential as well, and it just takes time, money, and effort. Great. So let me turn to closing remarks just so that I want to make sure that we're all done at 4.30. So Ben, any key takeaways or reflections from the conversation? No, I, I entirely empathize with the remarks around wanting more green walkers and less green talkers. Right? <laughs> I, I, I do seek out examples of how we're moving forward and where we're making progress. I'd say in the, in the venture capital space, it's not investment flowing into entrepreneurs was unprecedented in 2021. It's hit a bit of a, a slump the last year or so, but it's rebounding. And this, this clean tech 2.0 movement is different fundamentally than what we went through in 2004, 2005. See groups like Sublime Systems and Leia Ellis, a founder out of MIT, with a very, very innovative approach to green cement, and they're gonna be building their first plant in Holyoke uh, that, that is gonna be commissioned in 2026. So that is a, that is a green shoot if you will, in a, in a place where there haven't been that many, particularly on concrete. And then I, I look at our, our regulations now. We're building a residential um, development, potentially, up the street, not in Cambridge. Uh, it's 350 units or so, 50 of them will be affordable, required to be passive house under Massachusetts new specialized opt-in stretch code. That is a big deal. The fact that we have over 30 jurisdictions across the United States that are gonna have some version of a building performance standard in the not too distant future. Major jurisdictions like New York, Boston, Cambridge, DC, Seattle, that have them now, Denver recently announced one. <clears throat> These are big moves to regulate carbon emissions from existing buildings, not just new building stock. I see a ton of attention from our clients. I see a huge amount of folks in the boardroom with a dedicated committee just on sustainability at board level of a publicly traded company. That would have been unheard of you know, five years ago. So there's been a, a, a lot of moves in on this, and, and it gives me reason for excitement because I'm, I'm the one that stays up at night, but we're, we're not making progress fast enough towards our goals right? globally. That's so something we all share. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm going to pass the mic, but I, I think that, that the movement needs people like you calling folks out. Like, let's keep pushing. Let's execute. Thanks. And closing thoughts? I was in a room one time where an investor said, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want to see a number on how sustainable this building is. Show me in a number, in a score, of how sustainable this building is. The biggest barrier to action is an expectation that that is easy to do. 
because the systems are not set up in place to allow that to happen. And so it takes funding, it takes staff, it takes a business case to accelerate the ability for the industry to get that number, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, and so uh, patience is a virtue, but we are running out of time. So we're thinking about how do we cultivate the, the brains at Harvard, as well as the endowments of Harvard to accelerate. The answers are here. We just need to scale them quickly. I feel everybody's looking at me. I feel like no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't trying to look at you and say that. So everybody. <laughs> just, just being yeah. a HBS grad. <laughs> I'm going to leave you something that uh, is going to stay with you in a bad way. <laughs> the air and dust indoors is hormonally active. Oh my God. <laughs> Our team has done this research. Air and dust is hormonally active. That's not normal. <laughs> I'll just fill them up by saying this is, you know, Joe started with, this is a global chemical experiment and you and all of us and our children are the test subjects. And so I just think we must get every company, every consumer to care about petrochemicals and plastic proliferation. We need to set goals um, and we need to work together and, and really address this. This needs to be, this is another global systemic challenge like climate. It's the other side of the fossil fuel coin, as I said. Um, and I, I think the systems are not set up like Andy said, but if we work together and we align and we can, are consistent, we can. I mean, Patagonia just had got the PFAS out of their raincoats. It's still in all the weather here, but that's progress and that's because consumers were demanding it. So use your voice. Environmental Working Group is a great consumer product website if you're worried about now going home and what's in your house. Um, but join us, push all your companies. Look, I get all those Harvard grads and all those companies and organizations and governments to put this on the map and let's get this done so that we don't leave our children with a very toxic world where young people have cancer and are infertile. Great, well let me conclude by thanking all of you for coming. Uh, those of you who asked questions, I appreciate that and thank you very much for having us.